Hello geographers and welcome to this short video on factors affecting hydrographs. This is a continuation of your lesson that you will have done previously on causes of flooding and learning about the features of a hydrograph. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be thinking about once more those main factors that change the shape of a hydrograph, the impact upon how much water is flowing through the river and also the speed at which um, it's getting into the river, thinking about that lag time. We're also going to be thinking about a bit of an exam skill again today by thinking about explaining. So using lots of connective phrases and key terms to explain how each of these factors leads to a change in the hydrograph and the river discharge. So just a reminder of those hydrographs in case it's been a little while since your previous lesson. On the left hand side, this is a flashy hydrograph. Now as geographers and pretty much anybody that's interested in the flow of water, you are going to be looking at flashy hydrographs more frequently because these are the rivers that respond to uh, storm events or rainfall events in a bit more of a dramatic way. So there's going to be some reasons why all of this water has got into the river really quickly. That's why you've got the short lag time. And as a result of that, it gets there all at once and therefore you get this really high peak discharge. So today we're going to be thinking about those factors. So what I would like you to do now is just use these prompts in the form of pictures and diagrams to think about what affects how quickly water moves into a river as it falls onto the ground, but also thinking about changing the amount of water as well. So there will be things going on here that mean that perhaps water is stored within the drainage basin instead of rushing into the river and creating a high discharge. So pause this video now, have a think about those two things. And then once you're ready, you can unpause this video and we'll go through this together. OK, so let's think about this first one. So you probably will have spotted within this photograph. It's clearly a very wet day. And obviously we know that rainfall, particularly in places like the UK, you don't get rainfall happening every now and then. It can occur quite frequently. And if you've had a lot of rainfall before the storm event that you're looking at on your hydrograph, then of course that's going to have played a part in how the water responds and how the ground responds to um, the new rainfall event. So if you've had lots and lots of water falling onto the ground before this rainfall event, you're obviously going to have quite full soil. It's going to have absorbed and infiltrated and held onto lots of that previous rainfall. Um, and of course, the rocks that have done the same, if they are porous, they will have become quite saturated. So that will mean that water has no option but to flow over the surface and therefore get into the river really quickly. And also pretty much um, the majority of it will do so because there's nowhere else for it to be stored if that ground is full already. Some other conditions that can occur that change the way in which water flows um, are to do with temperature. So if you've got really, really icy conditions, you will get a frozen top to your ground. So it doesn't matter how empty the soil is or how porous the rocks are. If you have got this layer on the top that is frozen hard, then when that water falls down, it will again have no option but to go over the surface. So more surface runoff as a result of that and more water flowing as well because the soil is unable to store that water. Exactly the same thing can happen if it becomes too hot. So this might seem like a distant memory, but even in the UK, we do get baked ground where the top of the soil becomes hard because it's effectively been baked by the sun. Um, and uh, the same thing will happen there when water falls onto that ground, even though it's probably empty because it's been so dry and so hot, it will be hard on the top. So the water will flow across it over it and therefore create a short lag time and lots of water reaching that river. Now you're also given this photograph on the left hand side and I've also got a comparison one just for you to be thinking about the discussion here from a comparative 
point of view. So on the left hand side, obviously, we've got a really mountainous region and on the right, we have got a flat region. Now, as water falls on these places, of course, it's going to react differently. If you have got that mountainous region, then that water that falls is going to flow quickly due to gravity. And that's going to increase the rates of surface runoff, the speed of surface runoff. It's also probably going to increase the amount of water getting into the river for two reasons. The first is that, of course, if it's flowing quickly, it's got no time to sit and soak and infiltrate into the ground. And the second point is that often in these areas, you're probably looking at an area, particularly if it's very mountainous, where other factors aren't really in the favour of holding onto water. You don't have a lot of soil there. You can see it's really, really thin soil on that mountain and it's probably quite a volcanic rock. So it's not going to want to hold on to any water. And there's also not a great deal of vegetation um, on that as a result of the thin soil as well. So there's lots of factors associated with steep ground as well as the fact that it is steep and gravity will play its part. That means that you're not going to get a lot of storage of that water either. And then we have rock type, which I have touched upon already in that previous point, but we need to just look at this as an isolated factor as well. So when we have rock types, they are either porous or impermeable. So if you've got an impermeable rock, such as this one on the left hand side, it acts like a bit of a barrier. If that water falls onto this rock, it's got no gaps in it to take in that water. And therefore, when the water falls, it's going to go straight over it. It's not going to be infiltrated and percolated and absorbed by this basalt um, or whatever rock it is that you're looking at in an impermeable area. And therefore, it's going to just do that quick flow down to the river with not a lot of storage on the way. Contrasting to that, you've got really porous rocks. So rocks with quite a lot of space in them, lots of holes so that when that water falls onto them, they can actually kind of absorb that water a little bit like a sponge. And that's again going to slow down the water because it's gonna take longer for it to flow through the rock than it would have done on top of the rock. And also it's gonna hold on to water, reducing the discharge quantities as well. Vegetation plays a really, really big part in drainage basins. And again, it's for two reasons. The first is that it kind of stops the water. It provides an obstacle. It intercepts the water. So we've got a new water cycle process to discuss here. So as the water falls down, the precipitation falls, you're going to get it being caught by the vegetation and that will slow down the process of it getting into the river. So it'll stretch out your lag time and it will probably reduce that peak discharge because the water will trickle in a little bit more as it is being intercepted by that vegetation. And of course, vegetation is actually a really, really important store of water. So it, we know that lots of living things are made of water. They hold on to water. And of course, that will be happening here within images like this. But any areas where you've got vegetation, you're going to have a reduction of the water getting into the river because it will be taken up by this vegetation and stored as vegetation storage of water. And our final point um, is quite a big one because we know from our previous learning, don't we, that urbanisation is happening. We're getting more urban spaces and the way in which our urban spaces are built and planned will massively affect the water cycle occurring in the drainage basin in which this city has been placed um, for a few reasons. So the first thing is obviously there's no vegetation here that I know that's not always the case with cities, um, but in lots of places we've cleared lots of vegetation and therefore you don't have that interception. You don't have that vegetation storage. So there's not going to be that kind of role of slowing down and sucking up water being played by vegetation here. Another thing to note is this is the surface of a city. It's impermeable, isn't it? It's not a volcanic rock, but it's a man-made impermeable surface such as tarmac and concrete. So as that water falls down, it doesn't have the opportunity to get into the soil to, to kind of 
permeate and kind of percolate through those rocks in the slow way that would actually be quite good in terms of reducing flood risk. It sits on the surface and will flow straight across the city um, in terms of surface runoff that will speed up the amount uh, and increase the amount of water as well. It's worth also noting that I'm not going to spend too much lo too long on it here is to just think about drainage as well, because we actually do try and speed up water in in cities. We don't want it in our cities for too long because that would cause flooding. So drainage does actually play a part. It can speed up water in terms of how quickly it gets into a river so it can actually shorten the lag time if you've got drainage that are basically you know perfectly linear channels taking that water away really quickly without a lot of friction you're going to potentially create a shorter lag time um, so whilst that is probably a good thing for the city it might not be good for anywhere else downstream because you've got a shorter lag time being created by a man-made function so what your job is going to be now is you're going to be just spending a little bit of time um, trying to explain each of those factors. And you'll notice in your booklet that you have got a table in which you can do this. And um, we're going to go through one of them together and you're going to spend a bit of time after this video with a bit more guidance from me explaining the others. So here we've got the previous weather conditions as an example. And I'd like you to pause this video now and see if you can write this out by filling in those gaps. I haven't given you the words, I want to challenge you here. So put those words in pencil if you're unsure. And once you've written this out and given it a go, of course, unpause this video and then we'll go through the answers together. OK, so here we go. Previous weather conditions can reduce the amount of infiltration that can happen within the drainage basin around the river. For example, previous rainfall can saturate the ground and fill up all available spaces within the soil and porous rocks. So further rainfall has no option but to flow downhill as surface runoff. This increases the speed and amount of water flowing through and towards the river, increasing discharge and leading to a flashy hydrograph. So we've got lots of key terms there. A lot of those were the words that I'd hidden. And we've also spoken about, as you can see at the bottom, how that increases the speed of the water and also the amount of the water flowing into the river. So you're going to try and do this now for the other factors and you're going to hopefully use these two boxes here as a little bit of guidance. So I would recommend that whilst you're doing this, you keep this video paused on this slide. So I'd like you to explain how each of those factors lead to a faster rate of flow, so more surface runoff, a shorter lag time, and also how it increases the amount of water getting into the river. So don't forget that as we explain things, connective phrases are really, really important. I've got some examples on the left hand side in that blue box that you can use. But of course, you can use others um, if you identify them as more useful to you as you're writing. On the right hand side, we've got some key terms. So it's really important that you show that you're a geographer and you understand the processes that are going on as we lead to the, the kind of end product of lots of water getting into that river quickly. So you've got some keywords here that I think are probably going to be used the most, but don't forget that you have got water cycle processes, you've got hydrograph factors and features that you can refer to as well. So give this a go now, pause this video here. I would recommend giving this a go before you do what I'm about to recommend next. But you, what you can do is you can then check your answers by going back to each of those parts of this pre-recorded video to check my explanation and ensure that you have got clarity and everything that you need within your own written version. OK, so off you go. Best of luck with this. And of course, don't forget to reach out to your teacher if you need a little bit of help with completing this written activity. Thank you very much, geographers. Good luck and have a good day.